First, I'd like to express on behalf of the uh, Minnesota Physician Patient Alliance, welcome to all of you to Minneapolis. We have had a hell of a winter here and we're recovering and the green is beginning to come out. The tulips are pushing up if they're not eaten by the deer who have been starved during the winter. But you're welcome to the Mall of America after you finish the conference and we are all just delighted that you're here. I want to pay tribute to some of my colleagues who have showed up today and who have contributed mightily to the Minnesota Physician Patient Alliance. We do have a, uh, a website that you can look at. Um, I want to give a special uh, uh, tribute to my colleague, Dr. Bob Geist, who's been our founding mentor in 1998-97. And I would also like uh, to uh, mention uh, Mike Ainsley, who is a former chair of the Minnesota Medical Association, Dr. Gehrig, who's on our panel here, um, Doug Smith, who's uh, one of the founding medical directors of Minute Clinic, Rick Morris, who's uh, been uh, exemplary in asthma guidelines and challenging some of the nonsense that's been going on with uh, imposing so-called quality upon us. Uh, Dr. Lyle Swenson, who is not a former member of our MPPA, but is a former president of the MMA and a, a leader in our community. And uh, Dr. Merlin Brown, who's here someplace and who will be speaking later about his models to implement some of our direct pay models in Minnesota. And I also want to pay tribute to, uh, to uh, all of you for showing up and uh, Dr. Orient for organizing this wonderful uh, event. And the how to do it was how I started eight and a half years ago. I followed those guidelines in my private practice, which has thrived, and uh, I have uh, benefited greatly from the collegiality of the members of the board to, to make it work. So I want to just start by saying, uh, as sort of a summary, being a psychiatrist, of what I've heard so far, I think the main question is, who should the third party in Medicare, Medicaid, or private insurance serve? Who is this? Who is the real object of this? And, and I think our answer here, and I think all of us believe this, is it should be the consumer, the patient, the family, the person who buys the insurance. It should not be... Uh, a contract between doctors and third-party payers or even clinics and certainly not accountable care organizations and others who are sharing risk as Dr. Geist has pointed out so eloquently. And his material will be found on our website and we're going to be featuring even more of it. Uh, one of the, I just want to also mention that I'm, I'm a former trustee of the MMA and also a past president of the Psychiatric Society, and next week we will be talking to the psychiatrists about uh, direct pay, and I'll be getting to this in just a moment. But we really do believe that, um, that this is good for patients, and that patients are gonna be the ones who are not only gonna vote, hopefully, in, in, uh, in the fall, but they will be the ones who will drive the changes that are gonna be necessary to uh, modify what's going on now. And uh, we think the contract is between the patient and the family and the, and the payers. And, we, and so hopefully during the course of the day we'll hear, be hearing more about health savings accounts and other things I'm certainly this evening will be hearing more. But Dr. Richard Reese has been our sort of senior mentor, being a, the original Minnesotan and a great inspiration to me over the years. So I want to thank him very much for his astute comments and Dr. Huntoon's excellent summary of the situation we're in. Now I'm going to get on with mine and I'm going to make it short so that we can get on with others here. Direct pay psychiatric practice, it's a, it's a natural. Uh, it's a natural because our, our practices are basically time-based uh, and it's pretty easy to sell time and relationship uh, in this fashion. We don't have a lot of, we haven't been accused of the the Texas model of adding all kinds of lab tests and other stuff that we doctors are so greedy that we're bundling and doing all of this stuff. We don't have, what do we got to sell? In fact, I would add to Dr. Reese's admonition about pathology that psychiatrists do nothing and know nothing. That's the way that old adage went about the pathologists know everything and do it too late. But uh, we, uh, we do a lot. We, I've been involved in governor's commissions and all kinds of things over the years. The problem in psychiatry 
in the public sector is continuity of care and ongoing care. And what's happening now with the segmentation of care is, and you, most of you who practice, uh, it's pretty, not bad for consultative psychiatry in the hospital setting, not bad at all. I think one of my colleagues is here who we had talked uh, earlier about that. But the problem comes, what do you do when you want to discharge the patient? Or how do you even decide who should be admitted? And then what happens during the course of all this computerized inputting and electronic medical record stuff that's going on in the hospital? So our advocacy community, the Alliance for the Mentally Ill, I was on the board for 10 years and others, are, are very worried about how people get followed. What is, where is the relationship between the psychiatrist and the patient. Well, our, our American Psychiatric is going to tell us next week that it's team-based care now, and that's the line that we're hearing from family practice. I used to teach family practice residents for eight years. The problem is, who's the doctor? And the patient is now the electronic medical record. The patient is now the electronic medical record. It's no longer the patient, a, a human being. It's, a, it's a, an entity that's being inputted Who's going to integrate that? Who's going to make sense of it? It doesn't happen. But we have this amassing of data that has to be processed along with the stool. What, what's in it? What, what value is there in it? And, and after a while, the patients are, are, are very frustrated with this. And, and they, are the, they are driving the demand for direct pay psychiatric practice. So Tara Bishop and her colleagues uh, surveyed this and have found that un not unexpectedly psychiatry is among the leaders, uh, is the leader as a specialty in terms of direct pay practice in outpatient settings. As many as 45 percent in solo and small groups. I've been able to survive because I have colleagues who support me. I'm able to take vacations. Some of them have insurance-based practice, but most of them are shifting to a direct pay model as Dr. Huntoon indicated, we can do. So that's, that's the news. Uh, uh, and this is the detail on Dr. Uh, Dr. Bishop's work. Uh, somewhere around 45% now, uh, acceptance of Medicaid is only 43%, the lowest among all medical specialties, and Medicare also is down. So we, we, we know that this is happening in our field, and it's because the patients want it and like it. And uh, talking about niche, uh, I'm an addiction psychiatrist, too. So I gotten involved in prescribing buprenorphine for opioid dependency. We have an epidemic in Minnesota. 54 people died of inadvertent suicide from heroin overdoses last year. So I'm getting calls from those families to try to help evaluate people to get them into, into something that will f uh, prevent a Philip Seymour Hoffman event. So each of us in psychiatry then has to find what seems to make sense for us, be it child, adolescent, be it some variation of addiction, psychiatry, et cetera. We can bring the families in. As Dr. Mark Gallanter in your handouts from uh, New York has so brilliantly indicated, and we do, husbands, wives, we let the patient tell us who the significant network people are, and we bring them in. And this is not happening in primary care, uh, at least as widely as it should be. So we're able to do much more. So we're, our scope of practice is not limited. The patients are, are the ones that are driving the revolution here for us. They want us to, to be available to them. It's pretty easy to figure out how much we should be paid because it's based on time and relationship. And we, even if we try to do a concierge practice, that's essentially the, the, uh, the, uh, the issue here. And psychiatrists are much happier when they do it. Uh, I'm a, an adjunct professor at the University of Minnesota. I'm, I'm meeting with the residents and the graduate residents, most of whom are female now, and most of them are on the biological clock but they do ask the question, how will I be paid? How will I make this go? Now they're 30, 33, and they aren't terribly confident yet. They haven't lived until age 75 as, as I have, or even 40 or 50. 
30 or 9 or something like that, as others have. But you have to have some experience to do this. So the critical variable in addition, uh, it will be, are we going to have a therapeutic and academically supported private practice community for psychiatry? And I'll talk about that next week. Okay. Excellent administrative associate. Last year when we did the talk, I stressed how important that individual is. Uh, and my, my associate has been absolutely remarkable. And she answers the phone. I trust her with everything I do. She knows all of the messages. We get all of our message taken care of every day. We do not use the email to convey important information. We call people up. We leave messages. We talk to people. And we take care of it. We don't have complaints because we get our problem solved. Well, these are, these are my thoughts when I prepared this. I'm sure before the day is out, these will be more refined. But possibly, I don't know how the Medicare thing is going to shake out, but there's got to be some way that the patients understand cost and price visibility. And I'm not sure how that will happen. But certainly define dollar payments for these multiplicity of new codes and all of these things. And let the patients with, uh, with their computers figure things out. They can do it in the office while they're sitting waiting for the appointment and with their iPhones. We do need to do something about balanced billing in Medicare. And Dr. Gehrig and others uh, has, have, have really pushed that with our MPPA group, and that's absolutely correct. It's ridiculous that either we're in or out, and the patients are in or out, and they want to be in. So I think that, I think that we have the politics on our side here. And this is the final point that I'll make, and then I'll sit down here. The privacy and confidentiality in a psychiatric relationship is so essential. And patients are very concerned about how their data will be disposed and what will happen to it, who's going to get a hold of it, what ramifications, I mean, we look, Facebook, Twitter, whatever. I mean, it's accretive here in Minnesota with the Fairview system. There's always leaks. There's always patients do not trust the insurance system to protect their privacy. And we are operating in psychiatry in a stigmatized set of diagnoses, but not only chemical dependency, but any mental disorder. Patients know that. They want us to be able to use that to help them to the extent we can reference anything that might work to help them. But they don't want to compromise their privacy. So that's the reason that it's working so well. And I want to thank you for your attention. And I'll, I'll wait for your comments.